Jordan Merrick has released two albums, Night Music in 2019 and Waiting Blues in 2021, and he has a new single out called Fault, and we're going to talk about that. Hello, Jordan. Hey, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. And I'm going to plunge you into the deep end question-wise by asking you, what was the first song or album you ever fell in love with? <laughs> the, the honest answer, the absolute honest answer, I would have probably been about seven. And I think it was a Taxi Ride album. Oh, yeah, they were great. Yeah, and it was one of those, you know, back in the day when they advertised CDs on uh, on the TV, uh, I think there was just, yeah, it was, they released an album, they were promoing it on an ad, and I just said to my dad, oh, my God, what a great, great band. Can I get a CD? Never had a CD in my life. And then I, thankfully he got me that CD, and I think I listened to it at least, uh, you know, 10, 20 times. So I, I loved it. Yeah. Well, their song Get Set just popped into my head as soon as you mentioned their name. So there you go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but yeah, I think after that, when I was a little bit older, um, my dad took me to see Deep Purple play live. Wow. Yeah, which was, is that like a 10-year-old? That was uh, pretty, pretty wild. Um, so that's probably when I first started really loving the full band music and I could really appreciate, you know, just the spectacle of a concert. Um, yeah, so they, they were pretty big on my listening list after that that would have been qu quite a concert for a kid to go to because you know the, the sound's not exactly child tunes it's not the wiggles or anything like that and it's and I imagine the concert would have been quite loud for one thing mm, yeah it was it was crazy um I was never meant to go but um yeah my dad's partner was was unwell so he had the spare ticket and he was like who, who do I know that would go and literally everyone said no so I uh, I got I got dibs in the end, so yeah, it worked out all right. So as you grew up and taste change, obviously, was there a point at which you settled on a genre that you really really loved and thought, okay, I'm staying in this lane for the time being? Um, oh look, I mean, throughout my high school years, I definitely went went towards you know heavy metal and emo rock and all that fun stuff, you know, classic millennial music, really. Um, <laughs> And then probably when I got to about, you know, 16, 17, that's sort of when I started to get into um, like Bob Dylan. And mm -hmm. pretty much from there, I fell down the rabbit hole again of like, you know, classic songwriters and um, just fell in love with more so the art of like writing great songs. I thought Dylan was just this master. I thought I could never write this good. So how do I get better? Um, which led me down, you know, the path of him and Neil Young and then Nick Cave and Rodriguez and then, uh, you know, the list really goes on. So I'd probably say it was about then where I really settled into just basically trying to find the best songwriters I could to listen to. It's interesting because you say you listened to that and thought, oh, I could never write like this. How do I get better? Some people might have thought I could never write like this. I'm giving up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've always been a, a bit competitive, mainly with myself, not with others. So... I think I thought I was writing okay songs. And then when I, yeah, I had, I rediscovered Dylan and I realized I really wasn't. So I was like, I, I love writing. I've always loved writing since I was a kid. So when I was like, well, I want to keep songwriting, but if I'm going to do it, I'm going to have to do better. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Oh, I can see a piano behind you. Was yeah. is that an instrument you've played since childhood? No, actually not at all. I recently inherited this, so I was very, very lucky. Um, no, I um, when I first started playing music, it was it was on a little nylon string guitar. Um, right. Yeah, pure coincidence because I was never, I never really had a plan to be a musician. Um, and that sounds funny, like I never had any desire to play an instrument. But um, you know, bored twelve year old kid going through his grandparents' garage, and I found my sister's old guitar and. Uh, just was like, oh, it'd be cool to learn a song. I've got nothing else to do. Let's just try. And then, you know, from there, I basically started to love it. And yeah, it's been what, 18 years later or 17 years later. So if it was in your parents, grandparents' garage, it sounds like your sister gave up on the guitar. But do you remember her trying it for a while or just never really worked? You know, I remember, I don't remember how often she ever played, but it, she definitely didn't play too long. But there's one memory that I'll never forget. And that's, um, when I was quite young, um, she it was when the X-Files was, you know, the, the hit show. So she learned the theme on guitar and would play it to scare me. 
So, uh, yeah, I know it's horrible. I should have laughed. That's, that's uh, terrible. It's actually horrible memories all coming up <laughs> in their podcast. Perfect time to talk about it. Um, but no, it was, you know, looking back, it's hilarious. But she would just sneak up, start playing it. I go, ah, run away. Um, so that's probably my only memory of her playing it as a kid, uh, which is hilarious in hindsight. But uh, yeah, I don't think she's kept at it too long. I've got to say that's that's quite a lot of commitment on her part to wanting to scare you that she learned a piece of music specifically for that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you met her, it would make sense. But um, yeah, we always, especially now as adults, we always try to one up each other. So uh, <laughs> it, was, it was fun looking back on it though. So what's, what age did you move from nylon strings to steel strings? Uh, would have been, um, I think maybe 14. I, um, I upgraded and got a, like a $150 Epiphone, which had steel strings. But um, yeah, I mean, it was a good sort of guitar to learn on. Um, but it was probably when I was, uh, when I was 16, I got, um, I got my first uh, expensive guitar. Um, I, I was working hospitality and um, just kept saving my money to buy a new guitar and eventually found this um, this tack of mine that was like $600 secondhand and just loved it. It took maybe three months to pay it off, but literally every week I'd go to the music store just to play it <laughs> while bringing in a little bit more cash that I from, from the from the after school job. And eventually when I paid it off, it was yeah my pride and joy for a long time. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, when you did switch to steel strings, did was there a, a, a period of a period of adjustment where you thought, "My fingers hurt. This is not good." <laughs> they still hurt. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I I would say definitely. Um, when especially when I first made the swap, when I was you know 13, 14, however old I was, um, yeah, it hurt a lot. <laughs> I mean, you, you're not a guitarist unless you're you've split your fingers open at least once. So. <laughs> Yeah, right. Thanks, it's only ever happened to me once, so I'll, I'll take that. I think that's a pretty, pretty good run. Yeah, you've had your baptism by for the whole thing. Um, so yeah. you mentioned that you started writing songs when you were quite young. Was it just that had you, had you been a kid who liked writing stories, for example, and then you started channeling it into songs, or was just songwriting was the first creative act you can really remember? Yeah, no, I'd I'd always loved writing. So I I think I started writing short stories when I was I would have been. I mean, they were really bad, but I reckon I would have been maybe six. Um, I would just, because my brother used to love writing and um, we had the Windows 90, whatever it was, 98, I think. Um, and he had set it up so he could do some writing in it and he showed me how to do it. So that then I was like, oh, I need to try to write something. And um, I, I would write these, what I thought were massively long stories that ended up only being like 300 words. But as a kid, that's like, that's like Lord of the Rings long, you know? So, uh, but no, I know I sort of loved it from a young age and um, had, yeah, literally always had writing in my life. Yeah. But then, you know, when I learned guitar, it was just eventually it became like a natural transition because mm -hmm. I was, um, you know, starting to play guitar with friends and like, Hey, why don't we try to start a band? Who, who can write? I'm like, well, I like writing. I'll try. <laughs> and yeah, it sort of came from there. So you so, so you formed a band, obviously. At what age was that? Oh, I think my first band would have been 15. Right. And you were on guitar and singing? I did a little bit of guitar, but I was, to be honest, really bad at guitar for the first few years. I, it took me a while to get somewhat competent. Um, so I mainly did singing, but um, even then I was definitely... Um, I, I recently found some old demos from, I think I was 16 and I, I, I'm glad I've improved. So <laughs> well, like, like it's, I think whenever you look back on the work you used to do, it would, it would sound bad, you know, like even if it was, it was good at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I think they'll definitely, uh, you know, stay in the, in the vault, but um, yeah, at the time I, I, I was, thought I was quite good. <laughs> So when you're writing songs now, do you tend to just uh, like just keep writing, keep writing as ideas come up, you just stash them away or are you someone who mainly just keeps fragments of songs and then you wait to see what's still in your mind and what you want to work on? Um, I definitely find, uh, I, I always try to start and finish a song at the one time if I can. Um, sometimes it's, you know, easier said than done. Sometimes you come up with a really good section and you just can't, yeah, you just, you know, draw a mind blank and you cannot 
work out the rest. So sometimes I'll, you know, record the part into my phone and then come back to it. But um, yeah, I've always been a, a firm believer that if you're starting to write a song, you should try to finish it. Like you put it, put it aside the time to do it um because that way it's done and um you know you're in the moment when you're writing it you you know and hopefully everything connects um sometimes it doesn't you definitely write a lot of crappy songs and a lot of things that you just never finish but um i think when you can do it and you do finish it i think it's always a good feeling so yeah yeah are you ever a collaborator on songwriting or do you work alone um, I definitely am a, a lone wolf when it comes to songwriting. Um, it's definitely something I, I would love to do more of like with like other artists. Um, I love, for instance, it's not quite the same, but um, I've done a few songs where I've had, you know, other artists feature on them, like doing um, vocals on the track and stuff mm. like that. So I love writing with other people in mind. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely like to do a bit of collaborative writing, but yeah, I've always, to be honest, it's always just been a solo thing for me. Um, but it would definitely be a step outside my comfort zone and something I want to, I want to try to do at least like once or twice, you know, before I yeah. can throw it out. But it sounds like, you know, your own nature when it comes to creating and that is working alone. Um, now working alone was probably a necessity for you during national lockdown in 2020. You are from the Sunshine State, so you weren't locked down as much as some other states were, but we all went through that national lockdown in 2020 and you actually released seven songs over six months so I'm wondering did you feel that you wanted to document that time or was it just the case that these songs were were there and they demanded to be released um oh, to be honest it was I, because I just sort of fortunately set up um like this little home studio setup I've got here um so I just sort of lucked out of my timing um and then when the lockdowns hit well gigs were off Mm -hmm. um even with the day job work just was working from home so I was basically just at home all the time like everyone even when we weren't on lockdown because you know Queensland even when we we're out it still felt like a lockdown you know mm -hmm. a lot every restaurant was still closed you could just go to your grocery store or the park so um yeah I just did a lot of recording and um a lot of these songs you know I wasn't really planning on doing you know an EP or an album so I was just sort of recording and thought oh, I'll just release it now what else am I going to do and um, it's funny, like I didn't really think about how many I'd released until uh, recently I was reflecting on it. I was like, wow, I put out so many songs in that period. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, it was really great because normally, you know, especially when you start to release and you know, you've got, you know, publicity you've got to worry about and press photos and all that stuff. Uh, it was great just having the freedom of record, uh, so write, record, release, repeat. Mm -hmm. Uh, just for fun um so it was a really it was a really fun you know stretch of time in that way and it was a good distraction from you know the uh you know, crazy world around us yeah but having said that about releasing songs during lockdown from what i understand millennial blues was released on the first day of lockdown so you obviously had that one ready to go except listening to it it is it, it is really appropriate for what yeah. happened at the time it was released you probably couldn't believe it oh it was ridiculous it was um yeah, that week was just so crazy because it was also the week of my birthday. So I went from finding out I had a few gigs cancelled because of COVID, even though at that stage, no lockdown. I was like, what is this COVID? Uh, why are they cancelling gigs? And then you could just see that this something's about to happen, like a lockdown. And then uh, the day before my birthday, um, in my day job, my boss is like, don't come in tomorrow. Just, just, just stay home. Take everything you need home. I'm like, Oh crap. Uh, <laughs> so um yeah, that day they announced, yeah, uh, there's gonna be a lockdown. So my birthday, happy birthday. And um two days later the single was out. First day of lockdown. It was great. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, you seem quite relaxed about it now, but um but, uh, but yeah, so you released those songs um throughout that period and then you released Waiting Blues last year. Um, do you feel do you feel like you're still waiting for things to go back to the way they were? I guess, um, or should we abandon the idea? Do you think that they will ever go back? And I'm I'm obviously referring specifically to the music industry. Yeah, oh, it's it's a great question, and I wish I had the answer for you. Um, I think the music industry. Um, I mean, purely speaking for Brisbane, I think um, Brisbane's recovering quite well. Um, I don't think we're ever going to get back to the way it used to be. And I think particularly even just talking purely on a ticket sales perspective, I think 
you know, most, um, you know, punters out there aren't really wanting to buy tickets too far out because especially even now, like there's, you know, the, the, the COVID talk is ramping up again. And mm. um, so people are just afraid to, I think, to commit to things too far out, which for anyone promoting any sort of live event is just, um, you know, it's just an anxious nightmare. Cause you're like, when are the ticket sales gonna go up? And then the day of the show, you sell over all these tickets and you're like, oh, okay, it's normal again. So I think the, that part is definitely, I think that's gonna be here for a while. Um, but yeah, and hopefully I think, you know, touring hopefully will start to come back. I think if we can get through this year in one piece then it should improve again and again. You'd hope Hopefully, anyway. yes. Yeah. <laughs> about this year, so. <laughs> uh, now, as we've been talking about Brisbane, on that album, um, Waiting Blues from last year, there is a song called To Wong. And I'm trying to think if there are many songs that have honoured a Brisbane suburb uh, in their title. Powderfinger, of course, had Vulture Street as an album, and but that's a street, not a suburb. Do you know of any other Brisbane songs about suburbs? Well, songs about Brisbane suburbs, I should say. Yeah, actually, there's one, and I couldn't tell you who sings it, but there's a song, um, I was in the car one day and it came on, it was a song called No Place Like Nunda. Um, and it was it was so funny um, just listening to the lyrics because I used to live very close to Nunda and it was just so relatable. Yeah, um, yeah no, I'm, I, I don't really know too many. Um uh, yeah, Tuong was just, yeah, it was a funny one. It wasn't really written about the suburb, but I just moved here and um, and it just literally set up my recording set up for the first time. And I was like, okay, I need to, I need to record. I need to try to do some writing. Had everything set up, went to hit record. And then my neighbor with his lawnmower just starts going off. And I'm like, how's this for timing? Yeah. Um, and that's why the song starts off about talking about someone mowing the lawn. And it's literally... The song is just about that moment. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's funny. And then I think I just went on a bit of a tangent in the lyrics and then, yeah, it was a song, so. <laughs> yeah, the, the next door neighbour mowing is definitely a peril of the home studio, I think. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> now we'll talk about your new single, which is Fault. Um, and I'm wondering what the spark was for writing that song. Yeah, so it was, um, yeah, it was a few things. I think, so I wrote it in February when, um, when the floods hit Brizzy. And um, yeah, it was, I think from memory, it was literally the same week that the war in Europe had started. So it was that plus the floods, plus there was still some COVIDness around. And then you just turn on the TV and it's just political ads left, right and center while all this tragedy is going on around the world. And it was just so mentally exhausting. And uh, I mean, our place was okay, thankfully. Um, there was, uh, we nearly flooded, we just had to keep sweeping water away from the front door. But after like, you know, two days of doing that, it was okay. But um, yeah, I was just so exhausted mentally and, uh, and physically. And yeah, it was literally just sitting, um, you know, on the back deck, just sort of thinking about everything that just had occurred this one week. And um, yeah, tried to sort of write about it and it ended up turning into a song. So yeah, at least I got something good out of it. Yeah. Now you share vocals with uh, Maisie Taylor on this and uh, on Night Music, I noticed, and you mentioned that you'd had some guest singers and they were female vocalists from what I could tell. Um, so I'm wondering how you came to work with Maisie. Yeah, so Maisie I'd known for a while. And um, I mean, every time I've seen her live, whether it's, you know, playing on her own or with um, Hello Jane, they have a like, um, a great side project called Folkestone Avenue and um, she, her just her voice is just it's just so easy to listen to and her harmonies are just so beautiful so when I was sort of um, you know decided that I was going to record the song and I'd sort of done the first take and listen back I could just straight away hear the harmonies in there and she was literally the first thing that came to mind so um, I sort of uh, was really hoping she'd say yes and thankfully she liked the song and and was happy to to do the vocals. So yeah, we just uh, got lucky that she was keen. Yeah. So now that you have this home studio and you obviously write quite a lot, are you preparing more songs for release later this year? Yeah, I I'll, maybe not later this year. That's sort of a bit of a TBA, but um, I've definitely I've started working on on album three now. Mm -hmm. um, but that's going to be um, to be honest, after so many years of being in COVID and recording in in the little isolation studio um i've yeah just been really looking forward to doing 
stuff more in person. So um, yeah, I'm very lucky. I've got a, a really great band that I play with live. So um, yeah, so we're gonna we're sort of working in the studio now, um, and yeah, looking forward to you know, getting this next album done. But in a, definitely in person and in a more live fashion, which would be really great. And I think um, if all goes well, the songs will turn out pretty decent. Well, and as you mentioned, you have a band you play live with. I imagine after lockdown, going back to rehearsal would have been kind of joyous, but also weird. Oh, totally. Even now, like when we go to the practice space, like you still Glen 20 everything as per the CFA <laughs> rules. It's, it's almost become like the smell of Glen 20 has become like synonymous with this era that we're in, I think. Um, you just go up to the microphone and you just have the pundit smell. Um, it's there, yeah, the smell of COVID, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> well there you go so we've had a couple of triggers for you the x-files theme song Glen 20 <laughs> i think there's a song lurking in the oh, I, don't know. I don't know i think yeah if there is uh i'd be surprised but we'll see we'll see just call us on Glen 20 see what happens anyway <laughs> jordan it was great to talk to you the new single is called fault um uh, people can look out for your shows by going to your website and social media i'm sure and uh hope to hear new music from you soon when you're ready <laughs> yeah hopefully sooner rather than later but uh, thanks so much for having me on thank you